title of this thing is Evolution of Drum Machines. When I was originally talking about it, uh, we were thinking about sort of some of the drum machines that in the past few decades, and I pointed out that the first rhythm machine of a sort actually was created in 1932, and I thought I'd show some brief clips if you'd like to, to get a little idea about where drum machines were before we all thought they came in at around 19... 19- 80 or something like that. The one that's pretty much considered the first rhythm machine was something called the Rhythmicon. And it was created by Leon Theremin, you know, the guy that made the Theremin instrument. And he made it in response to a request by the composer Henry Cowell, because Cowell was trying to work with odd time signatures and wanted a machine that would do this automatically. So here's a video I found of an old Rhythmicon. Actually, one of those rhythms sounded like Lil Louis' video clash. The Chamberlain Rhythm Mate was another one. Now, the Chamberlain was later called the Mellotron, you know, the, mm-hmm. the keyboard where you'd play tapes. Press the key and it would cause the tape to play. And the Chamberlain was the first one, and he made this thing called the Rhythm Mate. <laughs> Now, Raymond Scott was an interesting character. He had a drum machine called Bandito the Bongo Artist. <laughs> and he was into making all kinds of interesting electronics. This is 1960. This is not a video of the machine. Someone just put some video around this. Uh, here's one that I uh, like, the Seaberg Selector Rhythm. This is where drum machines started to get really cheesy. This is where they had beats like Rock 1 and Rock 2. We're on a walk there, you can adjust the tempo. This one was uh, a kit that you could buy from uh, PAIA Electronics, and you could actually program the step time the different sounds in were analog uh, synthesizers. And also, it would actually it was the first instance I know of what's called song or chain mode, where you could chain patterns together. It was fairly crude to use, but it was uh, at least it was a, a real first. And this was uh, Roland's first attempt in 1978 at a programmable drum machine. It's called the CompuRhythm CR78. Mm-hmm. The only problem with it is it had no uh, quantization and it had a resolution of either 12 or 24 parts per quarter note. So what it effectively did is always turn your beats into a mess. And yeah. I mean, just listening to the sounds right there, that's like Kraftwerk, the model. That's yeah, like, yeah. That is. That is Kraftwerk's model. It's funny because the B-52s did a record called Mesopotamia that was really a big record in Detroit. And they're actually playing a drum pattern that's from the CR-78, but they're playing it on drums. Yeah. And it's really cool. It's really cool. That's great. Yeah. You know, if you go to Wikipedia and just type in drum machine, you'll mm-hmm. see all these in there. Mm-hmm. It's a very nice little historical essay. This is actually, to my knowledge, the first step sequencer. And this was by Echo in 1972, which I think Mm -hmm. was an Italian company. So for all you people that think I invented the drum machine, this proves I did not invent the drum machine. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious because Martin Ware had made this statement that where the synthesizer was screwed up was when they added keys. But on the first drum machine, it had keys, like keyboard keys, like yeah. actual keys. Yeah. Huh. I mean, there's a, a definitely a different logic when, when you use keys as opposed to pads. Mm-hmm. 
with how to program as opposed to actually playing it like a drummer because the, mm -hmm. the logic is really different. Another thing uh, that I was kind of curious about before, but I noticed it on the, on the PAIA, I always wondered how come the kick drum is on the left? That's a funny one. I think it's, it's uh, the difference between musicians who make products or engineers who make products. Right. Uh, because it makes sense if you're, for example, if you're a recording engineer, the kick drum is always on the first fader on the console, on the right. snare drum. If you're thinking in that in those terms, it makes a lot of sense. But if you're thinking about a gesture interface for using fingers to do the same thing that a drummer does with yeah, four right. limbs, it makes much more sense to devise a, a way so that those four limbs are most effectively used. Yeah, yeah. And particularly if you if you think of right foot doing the kick drum and the left uh, hand playing the snare, snare yeah. then you'd want to have that same right left on exactly. the uh, right hand on the button. I noticed that because my first drum machines, I arranged them in all the, the the sounds that I include, so that you had either right left with for kick and snare, mm -hmm. or at least down up. But often, when the, uh, some of the drum machines came out, they did that same thing where they put them uh, uh, the bass drum on one. <clears throat> I personally found that the um, the four by four uh, uh, somewhat limiting, and that's why in the new Tepes drum machine, I use a two by eight because all the pads are right in front where all your fingers are, mm -hmm. and so you can use your all of your fingers. Uh, much more. And I think a lot of people at first would use the drum machines, and I think a lot of people still do. They just use it with a couple of fingers and hit them real hard and, mm -hmm. and only basically hunt and peck like on a, on a typewriter. Mm -hmm. But I, I really enjoy uh, developing some gestures where I have, I'm able to play the whole beat in real time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's right, some of the guys are, are just amazing yeah. what they've come up with. Now, don't, don't you think that maybe by changing it from the 4x4 four four to the 2x8 two by, uh, mm -hmm. or 2x6 by, yeah, two by by eight, eight, yeah. is almost like putting a curved neck on the guitar. It's funny, and they see it at first, and they, then they start playing with it, and they say, well, oh, this is actually better, I like this better. The other thing, too, is nice is that it lends itself much better to, since they're all lit pads, to set programming, and, uh, and or, or tuning, using it as a, a tunings uh, for a particular, uh, one particular sound. But the main reason was uh, because I found it was just much better to do multi-finger uh, drumming in real time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted mm -hmm. it to be more of a real-time instrument, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was the rationale behind it. But how does that work with you being a guitarist and you actually making these drum? Yes, but I'm I'm a uh, secret frustrated drummer. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the original idea was I I used to be a songwriter and guitar player, and then I had a home studio, just a simple TAC 3340 four channel tape mm -hmm. recorder. I could play guitar and I could play bass because, like all guitar players, we don't really respect bass players. We just say it's, <laughs> it's playing guitar without two strings, so who cares? You know? And I could play some simple things on a Fender Rhodes piano I had and some early synths and things. Uh, but the drums are always the hardest thing to not only play but also record. I had worked with a, a musician who was uh, quite popular at the time named Leon Russell, and he was a very innovative thinker. He liked to record with drum machines because it would keep the time steady throughout the track, mm -hmm. and that way he could wipe off the drummer and put another drummer on, and it, it would still have good time. And so I, I, I saw the merits in that, uh, not in wiping off the drummer necessarily, but at least keeping the time steady. I saw that it would be great to have a drum machine, but wouldn't it be better if it sounded better? And also, wouldn't it be better if you could create the beats? You know? So that was mm -hmm. sort of the impetus behind it. At the time, I, I told people that this is not a machine intended to replace drummers, it's just another tool for the drum set. I mean, there's so many wonderful drummers, and this, these machines can never listen to the music and respond to the dynamics and to the rubato timing and to thinking of ideas. And, and the guitarist or the pianist plays something beautiful and leads the music in a certain direction. The drummer will listen, he'll play something else. Now, that's not always the case in overdub music, but mm -hmm. that, was, that was always the magic I found in great drummers, and I was just trying to create the best approximation that I could. And uh, candidly, I didn't even think it would be used so much for recordings. I thought it would be mostly used for a inspirational songwriting tool. Uh, funny story is, in the 70s, there was a disco producer named Giorgio Moroder. <laughs> he produced Donna Summer, and this, the Flash dance uh, soundtrack. And he was a big fan of my products. In fact, uh, every Christmas, he was good for buying another two or three. Mm -hmm. It's funny, right within about a, a half a mile, Stevie Wonder lived. And, and it was just it's a sort of my, every Christmas, this was my area of greatest sales. <laughs> They'd call me up and say, can I get this for my friend, get this for my friend. But Giorgio told me that when he was back in Germany making records, he liked the idea of just playing to an audience automatic drummer. So he would ask his drummer to record 20 minutes of kick drum, boom, mm -hmm. boom, 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 20 minutes of snare, tsh, do, tsh, 20 minutes of hi-hat. The drummer didn't like this very much, but what he ended up with is 20 minutes of a beat that he could write to and then chop pieces out. And he liked the drum machine because he said it, it didn't make his, his drummer so sad to have to, to do something so mechanical. I think the first drum machine that I got my hands on 
you know, it might have been Lindrum. Mm -hmm. That was that was really the first one. And then from there, I learned how to use 808 and 909s and HR16 and, and all that kind of stuff. So when I got my hands on the MPC 3000, after I had been using SP1200 and messed around with the 60, the 3000 really changed how I, I made music because it was a kind of almost an all-in-one production mm -hmm. box because you can sample a, a bass sound and, you know, just play bass with the pads and mm -hmm. have you know, snares and kicks, and you can have anything that, that you want, you know, you weren't regimented to the concept that there's, like, again, kick, snare, blah, blah, yeah, blah, sure. goes down the line, you know, voice could be a percussion instrument or, or whatever played in, in the MPC. I guess from my background of, of using it and then watching the development of especially hip-hop music, mm -hmm. you know, because guys like Jay Dilla, who was, who was a complete visionary on, on the thing. I was thinking about it earlier. It's like, without the MPC, hip-hop would not be the same. It just wouldn't be the same. Because SB 1200, you had people making hip-hop, but as far as it went, going crazy it was public enemy you know but mm -hmm. it was kind of a hybrid of of sp1200 and, and akai and whatever they had on their hands but when the mpc came in when everyone was using the mpc it just like really changed the whole face of of, of music yeah. because it was clean it was a cleaner sounding sample you know that people were using oh because comparison. the samples were a little bit better quality yeah yeah because like with the the 3000 it was the first 16-bit one right or was this yeah yeah well I'm not sure what is the first a 16 bit sampling drum machine. Drum machine, yeah. right, yeah. Because mm -hmm. the 60 and the 60 Mark II were both 12 bit, 12 bit right? Yeah. yeah. So with the 3000, it just really opened up a lot of doors. You know? hmm. Carl Craig and Roger Lynn, everyone. Thanks. Welcome to DubSpot. We believe in providing you hands-on experience right away. Whether you're completely new to music and want to turn the sounds in your head into a musical reality, or you're an experienced artist looking to refine your skills and add new tools to your arsenal, we're ready to meet you at your level. For students of all ages, all levels, and all styles of music, DubSpot is here to help you achieve your goals. With course offerings both online wherever you are and at our school in the heart of New York City, we are ready to guide you through the next phase of your musical transformation. Whether you want to produce music, DJ, or do both, you've come to the right place. Come explore DubSpot for yourself. Become a part of our community and make music.